workforce development diversity within existing training programs at CTSI specific courses and, and other formats. So we I have a few different formats to talk about that I think are, are interesting. And then the, we have a little bit of information on our first um, certain of people who've been through our program, and I'll describe a little bit about that and, and hope to hear some of your um, feedback on that. Uh, next slide. Okay, next one. So for Crown, we really like this definition about implementation science. We didn't choose to use implementation and dissemination science, we felt that most of the community that we were working and collaborating with in terms of investigators at UCSF and a broader community of health systems researchers were focusing a bit more on implementation than on dissemination. And so we focused on this definition about the systematic uptake of research findings and other based practices into routine practice, improving the quality and effectiveness of health services and care. So uh, next slide. So thinking about this, we wanted to think, like, what's the science part of this? And so we focused on um, this idea that there's a lot of methods involved in how do you promote the systematic uptake of research findings and evidence-based practices, what kinds of evidence do you use, how do you develop use developments, and how do you then use that to then improve quality of health services and, and I would say, community health more collectively. Brown is in public health and applied public health research and health departments. So I tend to bring in a lot of public health um, thinking to the training programs. Uh, next slide. The way we were thinking about um, evidence practice gaps, um, a lot of times people don't know what to do with the evidence. Um, so you know, there's the problem of being in a research institution where you're wanting to do good work with the evidence, but a lot of training on how to do that and, and easy ways of doing that. Uh, next slide. that there's a lot of evidence gaps out there. We know things um, in, in efforts to transfer things to other settings in, in, in public health and in global health. Implementation hasn't been done. It's not the right implementation or it's incomplete implementation. And no. Margaret, sorry. I think, I think we're getting some ambient noise. So I think what we may do is, I think we might need to mute the line and bring you back in as an individual. I'm sorry. Okay. What, do we hang up or? Uh, just hang on for just one second. You can hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Okay. Okay. Right, second. Okay. Yeah. No we problem. Trying to hear some but tingling <laughs> sounds there too. Um, okay, and everyone will be able to hear you better now. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. So, so we have this this evidence practice gap, um, both in the efforts of people to translate evidence into practice are not effective in a variety of settings for a variety of reasons, and also scientists don't often take on implementation as a uh, core study. So being in academic research world, but also working in healthcare delivery systems several affiliated with the university, we want to think of a curriculum that could help understand evidence practice gaps with a scientific approach, but then also would allow us to think through how to come up with the science behind that to, to teach to people so that they could incorporate that into the research so that the research could also lead to practice. Uh, okay, next slide. And so that we uh, encountered in the, the current community of researchers um, and people working in systems here was what's the best research evidence. So I like this example. It comes from um, the PBS News Hour um, last summer. Um, they were talking about some um, innovative designers, and they had a great tool. It was called a grinder. They knew it could grind peanuts into peanut butter really good. When they got over to the countries that were having a lot of nutritional um, issues and were under nutrition, we found that people didn't make peanut butter. So they identified that they needed was a peanut sheller because people used it. Is, is whole, not as ground peanut butter, and didn't like that, and wasn't going to happen. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, and so no, I'm sorry, it was it was an animation there. Go back one. The idea here on the right. What about evidence related to local local context and knowledge? This was missing, and we have an existing curriculum to help people think through that and to identify how to complement research evidence from perhaps very controlled environments, not controlled environments. So those are two things that we saw as the biggest tensions in our research community. Next slide. Identified, um, and as have others, the goals of developing implementation informed research and community gains. 
uh, interventions reach people whom they're intended, being implemented safely, efficiently, equitably, patient-centered, being co-developed and co-implemented. So these are all the lofty goals that, that we thought would be useful to train and add to training that was already here. Next slide. Science research that we were thinking about that was pretty practical, and the, the examples that people were um, starting to do in their work were identifying barriers and facilitators, um, change, working with community management, reach efforts to use uh, services more effectively or reduce access to things, uh, unhealthy products, for example, foods and tobaccos and sugar-sweetened beverages are some that have been prominent here in the area, um, identify strategies to promote integrating evidence into policy and program decisions, so working more with um, policy stakeholders. People didn't know how to do that. Um, interventions to population and yet still trying to think through what could be generalizable. And you evaluate things if people are already doing interventions or there's programs in place or there's new initiatives um, that are citywide or health department wide. How do you work on impact evaluation um, to understand these in circumstances where you don't have control in terms of a trial design? And uh, thinking through evaluation some more, different implementation strategies to be compared, for example, to improve clinician screening behaviors, targeting across staff and groups and leadership. So this is kind of the range of things that people were coming to us um, wanting to have more research skills on. And we also saw this was um, an asset in the community scientists we had who were doing work in these areas that we could pull in. Next slide. Like who does this? Um, these are the different uh, implementation-oriented disciplines we thought would be most helpful to bring into our curriculum. Now, since we're a health sciences university, we don't have as much access um, to social science disciplines through departments on our campus. So this has involved um, a lot more collaborative work with other institutions in the area. Of course, Berkeley um, is right across the bay, and that's that's where I did all my education. So that's that was kind of easy to think through as collaborative thinking about developing curriculum, but also there are quite a lot of um, social scientists at UCSF in, in different departments. And so we, we did some work to think through who to, who to reach out to, um, as well as the clinical sciences that we think of as traditionally involved in, in health research and, and developing interventions. And then, of course, I'm, I'm housed in the population science department of epidemiology and biostatistics, but as well, we have a very um, rich and experienced um, in terms of leadership and, and ability to complete things in terms of health policy here at UCSF. Um, the engineering sciences, there is, tends to be a pretty good background in bioengineering in our university, but not so much in some of the other operations and management. So those are some areas that we needed to, to fill in some gaps for. Next slide. A little bit to um, the concept of how we put that kind of needs and different um, areas of the way we were thinking about implementation science into a conceptual framework. Should I at the end, or should I take questions for each step of the way? Um, if you go through to the end, and then we can take questions then. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so this was um, done, um, you can see the differences here, Ralph Gonzalez and uh, was basically our leader to develop this, so getting into sort of history of our particular program. When the first round of our CTSI funding occurred, um, Ralph was given an opportunity. He was um, one of the directors of our um, K uh, Scholars program, but he was given an opportunity some additional funding to think through whether developing a single implementation science course um, or some kind of curriculum to embed within the programs where people already were getting master's degrees in clinical research and, excuse me, some other formats to offer. So he was given that, like, idea. He took that to say, I think I should develop, you know, a much bigger implementation science curriculum than, than a single overview class. And so he was given that initial invitation into a little bit broader mandate mm -hmm. and brought me to help him co-develop and conceptualize a series of courses. Mm -hmm. So we started with what are some principles that we wanted to have be um, in evidence in, in most of our courses and maybe have some overlap between our courses for. So first principle was um, engagement with stakeholders is essential at all stages. The change for principle two is inherent in translation of evidence into practice and policy. And uh, principle three would be that any kind of process of behavior change was going to be iterative thinking about cycles, bidirectionality, socioecologic, and not just focusing on individuals. And so those were some of the things that we thought would be essential to our curriculum. 
to um, sort of this tension around the literature around, you know, individual models or socioecologic perspectives, and I have this kind of, I think of it as a cartoon, but it's not. It's actually an advertisement slide. Um, it's from a corn industry um, uh, emotional piece um, advertisement, but it's high fructose corn syrup made me fat is what the, the man says, sort of calling out structural determinants of health, and a woman is saying, no, going back for thirds made you fat. And so this is sort of something we see this, um, also in this New Yorker um, cartoon, which is the time they'd passed the, um, I think it was man in big gulps, super soft gulps in New York City for a short period of time from some of the chain stores. Um, there was this, you know, hating on or attacking individual behaviors when really we need to go up after structural forces. So this is a very strong tension in, in the realm of behavior change research, and so we wanted to address it directly if we could in our curriculum by allowing people a variety of ways of thinking about um, behavior change. But this is one of the things that we felt was very important to sort of call attention to and not create such a black and white way of looking at a socioecologic approach to behavior. So with, and it's it's not the best infographic, they will, will collaborate information scientists at Berkeley to make a prettier picture, but essentially you're moving from left to right where you have evidence of some kind through a system. That system is made up of individuals, um, providers, patients, and public. The system also has delivery systems. These are our various kinds of stakeholders, hospitals, clinical practices, health departments. There's additional stakeholders, which might be government payers, insurance, and other society memberships. And each one of the um, blue um, sort of little um, works, is to imply that there's an iterative relationship between and amongst the different groups. So stakeholders and delivery systems engage with each other and they create their own forms of information and evidence. Individuals and delivery systems similarly engage and create their own, own forms of evidence. And like um, like I've said, the iterative nature of that means that evidence comes that engagement process into something that is current practice. Ideally, we are moving evidence into those systems and environments in ways that are developing best practices or um, implementing best practices so that um, population health is improved. So that's a general way of, of looking at that. Next slide. So I want to be able to um, look at these uh, real world gaps, um, thinking about generalizable knowledge, requiring these interdisciplinary collaborations and stakeholders. And when thinking about behavior, we wanted to think about that could help explain mechanisms for inner development, um, as well as thinking about how to do multi-level evaluations, as you can see from that conceptual model, across a variety of settings. Six courses, and I'll say a little bit about each of them, but I also have a slide that has links. Um, and we developed them. Um, the first two we developed first. Um, Ralph Gonzalez um, was the initial course director for the overview class, and then I developed a class on designing individual level implementation strategies. First course, uh, Epi 245, um, was embedded as an elective within an existing master's degree program. And I'll describe the structure of that in a little bit. But all of these were offered as creating courses within an existing master's of clinical research program. But we added them over time. So we had some startup money from our CTSI um, to give each person who would be a course director a little bit of money to develop the course and teach one time. And then after that one time teaching, we would see, you know, how it looked and what we thought. Um, so we had a um, sort of an oversight of each of the course um, um, curriculum, worked very closely with each of the course directors to develop these um, six classes. So overview class that goes over the principles of implementation and science theory. The one I teach uses uh, behavior change theories from a variety of settings to develop intervention strategies, mostly targeted at individuals. So even if it's a socioecologic approach, you might be targeting the leadership of your health department as well as targeting the staff. You might not only be targeting the or the leadership, but you might also be not trying to do a systems change through um, a mandate or some other kinds of um, policy strategy. So it's sort of as a distinction from organizational um, thinking. So um, that is what Epi 246 is, is thinking about organizational change and using sociology of organizational change to develop intervention strategies. So those are the three classes we developed. Um, epidemiologist Ralph is a um, Gonzalez is a clinician, and Laura Schmidt, who teaches Epi 247, is an org organizational uh, sociologist at UCSF. Then we developed a course on community engaged research, which was principles of community practice as well as principles of the research that is more likely to be a community-engaged model. And 
um, director of our CTSI Community Engagement Program. Um, Kevin Bach is the director of that course. Uh, translating evidence into policy is working more close with policymakers, and we had the great opportunity to have Andy, Andy Beinman, who was um, himself on developing um, policies at NASA. Um, with the Obamacare and other administrative policies around Medicare and things like that, um, develop this course into policy and advocacy. And that, um, one that is taught by a public health um, specialist on program evaluation. Next slide. So the, um, the current course directors of each of these classes and a link for future reference if you're interested in looking them up more. Next slide. And After we got this curriculum, it took us a few years. We started this in 2008. I think our first course is out in 2010, the first two. Um, and then we worked to get the six together um, in the next year so that we would then be able to have a, an integrated curriculum of those six courses. Now, people have to take all six, but I'll describe a little bit about the ways that they can take them. But we wanted if people took what we consider to be the course of implementation science, offered, um, which felt to be was four of the six classes that they were more able to design and implement effective interventions. Um, next slide. Evaluations um, on translation of evidence into practice. And, and write better grants, because we're a research institution where everyone is on soft money. Next slide. So this just gives an example of how the kinds of problems that people were coming in in two classes with were then operationalized in terms of the courses. So this, um, for example, is a project designing a community education campaign to promote colon cancer screening among adults ages 50 and over. So this was someone who might take, for example, this class focused more on individuals um, in the public setting and perhaps provider patient setting, and they take FP 246, the class that I teach, and the evaluation class. This would be a good complement for them to um, focus on their homework to apply it to that particular problem. Next slide. Uh, I'm thinking about a project that people would be coming into the classes where we're to think of ways of promoting public report cards of health plans for cancer screening um, rates. And so this is where someone might focus more on the organizational system um, developing a, a program um, with training and then also the evaluation course would be helpful for that one. We, um, um, say someone was looking at uh, these other issues about translation to make cancer screen free for Medicare beneficiaries. They would they would work with Andy in his class around the advocacy and policy strategies, as well as thinking about an example of community advisors to co-create intervention with a research team to try to um, focus on some strong targets the community had prioritized, for example, social marketing to venues that promote teen smoking. This might be something where the community engagement model would be essential for um, that kind of work. Um, examples of how the courses can link to specific um, pro interest that people brought to um, implementation questions. So formats that we offer this in, as I mentioned, the first format we offered the courses was embedded in um, an existing master's program, the training and clinical research program. Um, so that is something the department has had for a long time. It has a one-year um, sort of um, print of, of research um, version. It has a two-year master's program. So within the two-year master's program, we offered an implementation science track where you can have your master's degree and then you get special designation in implementation science. So that's the way we set up um, to offer a structured program. These are degree um, granting programs I'm talking about first, so the six classes. Um, and when people do that, they have um, they don't have six classes. Like I was saying, they take about four of the six, but it's customized as well. There's a whole bunch of methods, classes they can get if they're going to be um, in-depth interviews because they want to do a qualitative, community-engaged project. Um, they might be more likely to take qualitative methods as their methodology course. Similarly, if someone is doing a different kind of um, economic modeling and trying to do um, an internet that is, is much um, focused on, 
on economic incentives, they might take a different kind of policy class as their methodology. So there were some complementary classes as well. But in terms of what we developed, our six courses, and what we required people to do, this was how um, it was set up. So 31 people who have done the series of six courses plus the other methods classes since we um, started in 2010. So we have about five people in this matters track a year. We have a lot more people. Um, since we sit later, but the certificate program is the next uh, for the curriculum, and so people can take the six classes. They have to take four of the six classes, but they don't have to take anything. So this is what a lot of people do who have PhDs who don't need additional um, master's level training in clinical research. We've also had quite a few senior faculty come through with training grants and have their teams take the certificate program. So the certificate program includes a, a probably a less typical learner um, for um, for what we would usually see um, in our in our courses at, at this university. So we've had people do that, and this is sort of increasing over time. We've had kind of higher numbers of people doing this. And we also have a lot of staff who take the certificate program, so people who've brought um, up the programs that they work in and then want to be more skilled at, at doing um, a lot of the implementation aspects of the research that's part of their program. So they're in um, different types of staff positions as, as well. And the third way that we've offered this in sort of a um, more structured, um, um, granted of units format is people just take uh, classes as electives, these six classes. And there's a lot of people who do that. We have 100 and almost 60 people take um, these classes as electives. Next slide. So this is of the other kinds of electives people take when they go for the methodology um, uh, components um, if they're doing the particular track in the master's program. So they get some more in-depth methodology besides our implementation science-focused methodology. Okay, recently we've developed um, curriculum have been um, there's there's been a lot of interest in making an online version so we've been working really hard to do that and we're actually starting next week with our online classes the first two classes um, the overview class um, of implementation science and the class I, I teach on developing intervention strategies uh, those are going to be online this quarter and we're also offering those in a certificate format where people sign up ahead for all of the classes, um, or they can take them as we've done in other formats, just in so we're trying to broaden um, our curricular reach. We um, also have a grant. We have, I think it's in the third year now. Um, it's been with um, myself, Bibbins, uh, Kirsten Bibbins Domingo, and Alicia Fernandez. That's from NHLBI, and it's focusing on um, an implementation science. Um, for equity, um, we have a summer camp where people come for a couple of weeks, a lot of implementation science training and works in progress and career development for junior faculty. And so this um, then has a distance mentoring component over the subsequent year. Everyone comes back for year two. So we've just finished our first um, graduating class from last summer to this summer and have um, finished our curriculum with the cohort. So we have this model. And I think some other implementation science models that are like this, like the tighter um, program and things like that that go into the um, kind of on-site immersion of implementation science and then some distance mentoring. So this one is um, something as well. I've also done some international um, training programs, uh, mostly through collaborations that were already on the ground. Um, for example, in Uganda with Macquarie University, where there's a strong um, public health school that does a lot of applied research and has themselves received Fogarty um, Implementation Science Grants. We've partnered with researchers here um, that do implementation science collaboration with Ugandan colleagues and done um, summer institutes in Uganda and then have a large number of the faculty taking our certificates so they can then run their own programs. So we have that model as well. Uh, also done one with a WHO group um, for Regine. Um, for East Europe, uh, with a similar kind of two-week, um, but you know, we go down and we do the training, and then they take it from their kind of model. Um, next slide. We're setting up our online um, program, uh, two classes per quarter, um, and so six are required to get the certificate online. Other people can take them individually. 
of the research um, from people's um, projects in our courses, just to give a number of, of the range of things. Um, so controlled intervention trials, um, community-based TB screening bans, increased TB case finding. The adapted diabetes prevention program reduced diabetes risk factors in high-risk populations. So these are two um, NIH-funded implementation science proposals. The first one um, by Luke Davis went to the um, implementation science um, uh, review committee. Uh, implementation focused trials on methodologies to um, to do you know compare across different types of approaches um, for implementation. So, what strategies are most effective in linking TB patients to care and retaining them to the end of treatment? So, some comparisons of different um, practices there. Um, which medical home referral programs best engage a psychiatrist in managing cardiometabolic outcomes in severely mentally ill patients? Um, what of referral to home versus center-based cardiac rehab after hospitalization for, for MA, um, or other um, uh, cardiac events. And, uh, so that was one, the uh, last one by Mary Woolley was um, one of your um, faculty who took our curriculum as certificate program and then turned her homework into a PCORI grant that, that was funded in the Browns. So that was a, like one of our success stories that we, we like to talk about. Next slide. Alumni survey just this last uh, this last winter spring um, for the people who in those first two degree programs the uh, intensive immersion um, where they either did the implementation science track in the master program or they did the implementation science certificate so they had to take an intensive number of implementation science courses um, so focused on two things sort of like what um, you know who are what's their productivity how many grants and papers have they been writing what's their position, and then things that relate to competencies focus on implementation science, so different kinds of comfort in you know, developing an evaluation plan um, to you know, running a focus group, doing community-engaged research, so we have a variety of competencies. I'll present a couple of, of um, analyses just to describe a little bit of who our training um, population is, and we haven't analyzed the competency yet. Next slide. We had a good participation rate um, amongst the people who had been in our programs, and this was um, since 2010. And for the 54 people who we have, and here is a little bit of information that sort of describes um, their current institutions. For example, um, how many of them are at UCSF, um, principal faculty positions, um, people in terms of their um, race, uh, ethnicity, background, and um, male, female. So it's actually, by and large, has been a female. In a group of women in our classes, um, two thirds. I think that's different than the overall team, but I don't, I don't have have those comparisons yet. So it's sort of interesting um, regarding that. Um, this is a little bit of the kinds. Now we ask specifically implementation science related publications. Um, really high number um, from that 54 individuals. Um, so we haven't gone back and looked at all the different papers they've written, but we found that really very interesting, high high numbers from, from our perspective. Um, I'm not sure somebody really wrote more than 40 papers, but um, we go to see. And then, and then something that I want to dig into a little bit more, but looking at um, kinds of grants that were funded, and so I think what we're going to do is is look through um, NIH um, grant sites to, to get a flavor for what actual topics of the grants are so we can see a little bit more on how people are turning the um, specific content that they learned into applications and those RO3s and R21s. So we don't know. They could have written them on, on non-implementation science topics. This is what we had asked them was which ones were funded that were implementation science oriented. And this was as a PI or a CHI or as a Cohen investigator. One more. So this is just um, for more information. This is for our um, training program um, details we have, and then um, Adis Ramachi and I are co-directing the program now, and he's one of the um, first, gra he's the first graduate of our program and has done um, incredible implementation science work in tuberculosis, so we, we work collaboratively on this curriculum at this time. And I guess I'm questions. Great. Thank you so much for that great thank you. Some amazing graphics you've, you've made. I think that we um, opened up the line, so just wanted to see if... Um, Open it up to see if anyone has questions. And if you if you want to get your question, that that works as well.
Well, before formulating their questions, um, Greg, I wonder if I could ask one clarifying question, which is, as far as the audience for the online version of the program, is that, um, does that target does that target the same kind of faculty and students that were taking the class, but it's really about convenience and, and making it just more feasible? No, not or, yet. Actually, we were um, working out how to do that in such a way that doesn't interfere with the existing. So, like, for example, when I said I'm going to start, um, you know, we start our program next week, I'm actually teaching my in-person class as well. I think that we actually restricted if you were a current trainee at UCSF, you could, could do the classes through an existing in-person program that you could not take the online class. So we have um, essentially recruited outside of UCSF. Now we want to work out maybe some kind of flexible model if we still have people, you know, there are a lot of people who have said, I would love to take that class or that program, but I can't come down to, you know, X you know, located on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. So we like the idea of making it flexible in the future and working at that out with a department, you know, how to, how to navigate, you know, is housed, how, you know, is the curricular overview the same? You know, so there's some things that we're working out at the departmental level about to what extent we want to do that so that we don't interfere with the programs that are already in place. Follow up. How does the how does the funding model work for that? That is it for these old individuals, or you're, are you grant funded for now, and you're kind of working out how the online might be? No, active? we we have no funding. We don't have very okay. much funding. Uh, but but no. so so what? One of the impetuses for moving it to online more quickly than maybe we would have done if we were just sort of plodding along in in normal pace of like one course a year um, was because we have had these. Um, so some of those emerging experiences where we've had people coming from our summer institute, so you know, tourists now, and they've said we want to take your curriculum, but we live in Pittsburgh, we live in you know Florida, and so having done the two-week immersion, they've said you know please put this online, we'd love to have this on. We we had that program sort of generate that interest as well as the international audiences that we've worked with. So we really wanted to make it much more widely available. For example, to, in the partnership with McCary University, you know, if they wanted to be able to offer it to people who aren't necessarily on site within their country, they could have a version of this that they could then, um, offer as well. Our approach is to, we opened up recruitment kind of globally, but particularly have a lot of people enrolling from those two programs where we already have pretty established relationships. And so we advertised some, not extensively, um, about the program. So so have, um, those programs have something that they can pay for people to enroll. But we have, a, you know, if you're in the UC system, you have a slightly cheaper deal than if you are in um, non-UC. And then if you're taking a series of classes, like the certificate program, you get a deal on your class paired with if you just take a class here or a class there. So we have different classes. So we're working on a model where we will, CTSI has helped us make uh, videos that we have for our online and create our site, and handle the kind of financial management. So pay them back that startup cost, and then our program hopefully will generate revenue that we then pay the course directors, pay the TAs, pay us, but just pay per course director model with revenue and then some money to go back to hopefully enrich the curriculum. Thanks so much. It's really helpful. From anyone who's participating on the call? But I don't want to stop the conversation. Let me build a question. You you mentioned, Margaret, the um, and I was I wondering if that was a school that you you've been doing so much. Is that a school that where you've had conversations yet about how faculty there might sort of participate in the, either the current or maybe a future iteration of the implementation science um, program, or is that that's sort of on the list of possibilities for the future? Yeah, I think you know it, I would love to have connections for that. I mean, I think we've had a little bit only through like a specific project where someone has collaborated on a bioengineering device, and so that then led to us 
knowing about some maybe literature that we wouldn't have accessed because of that collaboration, but not actually bringing the collaborations presence into our curriculum. So we, one of the things we wanted to do with our, um, if we were to have some extra revenue, was to have a series of workshops with UCSF, Berkeley, and possibly um, San Francisco State, which we have a lot of collections at, and they're much broader departments um, across more disciplines, to have some um, sort of workshops where the principles of a topic get explored from a few dis disciplines and that, that we can use that as a way of, of thinking through what kinds of content would be useful for teaching. We, we want to develop some, you know, whether they're half-day workshops or symposiums of bringing in, you know, an engineering problem from the health systems perspective and entering, you know, a that is something that is relevant uh, perhaps for a systems redesign then incorporate. And so, you know, we've done that kind of through individual research collaborations, but not in a more systematic way. So I, I would love to do that. I don't know if that's something you guys have done in your work in L.A. Um, it's such a big maybe somebody who's uh, exploring it, but I, I think it's on the, from the perspective of, uh, I think the DI perspective and also from the health program here at the CTSI, I think we're planning to have a conversation this fall as we think about um, building up science capabilities and particularly in partnership with the with the department. Um, yeah. And uh, maybe something too, I know we've we've talked about the possibility of some collaboration between some of the UCs or the California CTSIs or in combination and now that you're in the online space that certainly makes it easier to think about if there's a way for us to maybe capture on any resources that we, we have, I think that are untapped at both of our, <laughs> at all of our institutions and some that maybe you've tapped or, or vice versa. So yeah, it might be a conversation that, to continue. No, and I think in that same, you know, I was thinking one of the um, CTSIs that I had um, gone and done a, a visiting scholar for their desire to do some implementation science is that they um, was in Wisconsin at Madison and they had, you know, amazing faculty in engineering who gave, you know, really amazing presentation about how she she was using her system science engineering approaches to redesign health team experiences in hospital settings. And so she was going and describing sort of her, you know, into the hospital approach and doing some system redesign, on uh, not like mechanically changing the actual structure, but around the team-based approaches. And it was fascinating, really interesting. It's that they had a very strong collaboration with their School of Engineering and they had a lot of other collaborations developed through, you know, other like schools of education or social welfare and other social sciences, but had a very strong collaboration already with engineering. So that was a really great, great example. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I think in the chat, um, Aaron, thanks for your, your um, just noted that you're having some challenges with audio, but just mentioned um, the interest in um, in what UCSF is offering. And I think what, what you posted is in a chat that interest in um, from me and from the different organizations for students in these different uh, CTSIs having access to the same thing that uh, UCSF has developed. So that sounds like a little bit, a little bit of that is a challenge all of us to think about what we can each do as CTSIs to um, our own offerings, but also, of course, to take advantage of, of what developed at UCSF. Yeah, models that you know that we we have so. We are trying to use some of our um, you know, that we get. So we, we don't have, it's hard to find people who can, you know, run seminars or do small groups. And a lot of the work is small group learning. So things that's been good to offer with a different model um, is that instead of having maybe an assigned TA who has like 20 other courses that they're doing in a full-time job um, and have to has to do like one TA requirement, you know, for and we can pay people who are junior faculty a stipend to be a small group um, leader. And this is what we're exploring in this first fall creation. But it's a way of, I feel like, building the faculty to then be able to have a bigger implementation science bandwidth for our, our university. So that it's not like people were asking the same people because they're the ones that on the program, but actually people have been able to get more experiential learning and paid for it through the, the teaching collaborations. So we're hoping that that's a way, like a model that moving forward will bring a lot more um, people who like take on the classes but really enjoyed it, but now they're not really sure what to do with it. They're off doing their research, but to bring them back a little bit for some of these teaching experiences and make it much more, um, you know, they're working really closely with the faculty, they get paid well, they're, you know, allocating real time for it. 
um, and working really closely with grading people's or you know providing comments essentially for people's applied protocols, which is another great way of learning too. So that's what we're trying to do, and I think it's a great way, hopefully, to to bring in um, a larger group. Yeah. Yeah, so, that so we don't know yet. <laughs> we're, we're starting, but we had a lot of people say yes to the being, you know, the small group leader. And you know, we have some a couple people doing it together. They're co-leading a small group. So we have a, for example, a colleague in Uganda who doesn't quite feel like he could lead a small group yet, and he's partnering with one of his mentors. And so they're together doing the small group, and that seems like a good sort of train the trainer model. Mm -hmm. Happening? Are you starting with one of the the courses in the curriculum now, or a few of them for that? Yeah, the, the two ones, the um, the overview course, Aditya is teaching that, and I'm teaching the one um, in person, and I'm also teaching online, so I'm going to be pretty busy the next 10 weeks with, with those two uh, two courses. And then we have, there was one of the slides that shows our plans for the two in the winter. Uh, it's going to be um, original um, instructions, um, top submit, and, and then the other one in the winter is going to be um, programming, I think. And engagement and um, policy, health policy will be taught in the spring. So we're working to kind of get all those course directors' uh, materials together in, in the next six months. The, I was going to ask you a little bit about um, as you think about scale, you know, given what the demand is, the demand that's probably greater than what you can meet, but I guess you're still exploring that as you develop these different offerings just to see what kind of demand you get. And then I think about what these different opportunities are to kind of expand the number of people who can teach for something like you found one one really interesting way of doing that with the difficulty you're sort of in a transition in both beginners and coaches. And then they are required to do some teaching, but but you know, this this is probably a much more you know, they can directly apply it to their own research because they're choosing to be in this in this space um, in terms of their the concepts, and so I'm hoping that 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 way of them getting a lot more practice, um, so they can turn it around in their own their own um, work. But then what we also are hoping to do, I mean, I'm not sure all the um, the people who are rolling, you know, a lot of them are in uh, positions of program leadership, and so they're um, what they're going to bring to the program and how they're going to hopefully inform us to change. You know, we're starting with a pretty academic research model within an existing, you know, graduate program and trying to move it into these different spaces. And that's one of the things that we really want to do, but we need to do that through, you know, processes that are not really in place right now. So when we do these immersion experiences or we have um, people in our courses that are coming from different applications, then get to see, you know, like that side of like, you know, the local knowledge and the, the evidence that's coming from a variety of settings, not just the clinical how do how do you actually put that together and and ways that can inform um, our future education? So that's an area that we want to be able to move to you know your public health um, version of things that we do. Um, so what we're hoping to do, and if anybody's interested, um, let me know. But we're trying to develop a case study library where people have maybe a, you know an audio recording where they walk someone through a few slides describing their project or their implementation science idea or their, you know, what we call kind of homework that they've done for the class. And then we have an archive where people can then come go. And that doesn't have to be within the courses. That can be broader. Um, but, but we've gotten a little more comfortable with using Camtasia recording for our videos, but actually for audio case studies, it's very easy to use. And we would like to be able to have um, accessible to the community, maybe across CTSI, a broad range of these. So we're going to let that. All the TAs have to do it um, as part of their payment. To They have to make their case studies and have them available for students. So it's an area I think we could even do, you know, within the CTSI communities in California to start that um, available. And then people can say, oh, that's what I want to do. I, I guess I understand what implementation in science could mean. You know, I think that was something I was interested in. Um, so that I think could be really useful. Thanks. Any questions or comments from from on the on the line? Um, Mark, if, 
it's always great to end on time in a few minutes before so folks can get to their next meeting. But I guess I had one last question, which is I'm just curious, um, as you, in terms of the participants in the courses, I, I wonder from the evaluations or just your comments for them, they've said anything about this was fantastic and I only wish you had why, you know, on their on their wish list. Is there anything that's come in that in that way that you're thinking about in the future? Planning on your, on your plate already? Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm I'm I would like to develop a class. Uh, we we've had um, people have been interested in mixed methods, and so I think you know the the community of learners that we most. Uh, work with our clinician researchers who've really often not had much exposure to it. And we sort of talk them into, it can be really good to hear from people about why they don't do what they, you know, you want them to do or whatever the question is. Um, and then and then people often get very excited to learn some of that skill set, but they really don't want to become a qualitative investigator. That's not what they're going to do. And they might want to partner with people. And it's come up that people want to know how to write a mixed method its aim for their, you know, career development awards or how to how to incorporate something that has more usefulness in terms of sometimes on the programmatic side, narratives that have come from the community that they're working with. So that's one topic that's come up. Uh, people say they, want, they don't just want to go get qualitative methods. They don't want to, like, complement their 500 courses in EpiBioStat with one class in qualitative methods. They actually want to learn how do you integrate them, how do you decide on the research design, so something that I'm really interested in developing. So um, in my free time, I'll do a colleague who's an anthropologist who's done some, uh, we collaborate a lot, Sarah Ackerman, and he and I have, have been sort of tweaking around a few ideas for a course. Um, so maybe we'll do that down the road. Great. I think as we continue our conversations about collaboration, potential collaboration between some of the CTSIs in California. I could think about that kind of question about what we what we each don't have that you know potentially we could have sources to at least offer on a initial prototyping scale and then think about what it would what it would consistently so just hearing what you the kind of feedback you've had is very helpful in, in terms of our own local strategy. yeah well, you know I think the idea of getting introduced to some of these concepts earlier in people's training so you know we have some doctoral students who are taking it and, and and I think, you know, the idea that, you know, can you introduce some of these concepts in other, you know, biostats classes or science? Like, what are the different ways that, you know, examples of some of the more implementation science questions can come into any clear stages of research training would be great for programs that have undergraduate, large undergraduate programs, because sometimes, they're like, by the time people come to it, they're like, why didn't I learn this before? I have to relearn the way I look at things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the idea that to, to think about what a course options um, in undergrad programs for which this could be either a small module or, or a component, um, I think, is a, an area of, of importance. Yeah, great. Excellent. So very much. Well, um, the evaluation that's um, just being sent in the, the poll question, so if folks could please complete that, um, that would be very helpful to us just for future planning. And again, I want to, to thank you so much, Margaret, for sharing um, all the questions. Um, inspirational and, and I think help greatly locally about what what we might think about. So um, really want to say thank you and I hope our our conversation um, continues. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks.